Um, just a disclaimer that these are traveler's notes, meaning that I was just uh, uh, kind of slowly walking towards Rust uh, in a matter of like half a year. Uh, my bread and butter is generally uh, TypeScript, which is a superset of JavaScript. So um, it's not necessarily only JavaScript to Rust, but TypeScript as well. Um, so, well, let's start with what is what what was the thing that uh, pushed me towards i was trying to learn rust and i was trying to find reasons to kind of to expand my knowledge and uh, the things that attracted me were like a really thorough compiler um, though i was always wanted to find out how is it comparing to typescript which itself is a very much like a jack of all trades wrapper around javascript compiler so I thought like, okay, um, let's use Rust It's um, and learn a bit of, well, I didn't say rendering per se, I was interested in doing rendering and then eventually probably transitioning to rendering using Rust, though um, looking at how this uh, WebGL was a bit, um, I, felt, I felt I was afraid it was gonna be, get really boring, so I skipped that part. I was actually struggling for the first couple of times to learn Rust and then I decided like, okay, maybe I'll just uh, write something in what I know, TypeScript, and then uh, migrate it slowly to Rust. Um, then also uh, in a uni, I used to, we had this uh, like a coursework with like a tiny bit of a simulation with trucks moving around and carrying their cargo and stuff. They're like, okay, let's do a little sim. I'm like, okay, I'm not gonna do the cargo thing. Let maybe do a little tiny shooter and then okay, I thought, okay, so everyone implements it using Unity and C sharp and maybe I can just push a little bit of more towards still using good old browser guts and something browser related and do a good performant thing. Uh disclaimer, it's haven't happened yet. I haven't finished I finished the code, but I haven't actually attached Rust code base to the JavaScript rest of the thing. So I want to do a part two of this notes uh, next time to see how it compares with a purely JavaScript written uh, simulation. Um, and well, the good thing was that I supposedly could just like do a little bit of removal of some glue code and uh, move the whole simulation bit to the back end instead of doing in a browser because doing in a browser is quite simple because you can just import the package and then start calling functions and that's it you don't have to do this transport layer thingy so um these are the notes about what i stumbled upon like what are the bumps and to me the first thing is well i called it memory juggling because to me, it, it felt first like magic, and second, I started getting the like kind of some very old memory of my uni courses about the stack-based memory and stuff. And one of the things that I was really interested in: how does it mutability work in Rust? And I was like, okay, Rust is super safe and got all this mutability thing is by default. Uh, comparing to JavaScript, where like everything is mutable unless you use uh, TypeScript, where you have to put read-only uh, keyword to every single JavaScript property to make it kind of like compiler disallows this behavior thing, but in the end it would still, if you want to beat it, you can beat it. With, I thought, okay, maybe Rust does it better. So uh, surprisingly, not really. Rust is very much, you can do it anytime you want, unless you like, but it's only if you really, really want to. So you constantly have to ask Rust to allow mutability and then nothing is stopping you, which I find is like good. It's good default. I'm tired of, of this default where like take the gun and blow yourself on a foot and yeah. So Rust much, 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 much better approach and still allowing all this window. So no one can enact saying, oh, with Rust, it's all immutable. Like, no, that's not the, that's not the case. It's not like I've tried uh, ReasonML I also wrote a small program and it is indeed always wanting mutability unless you have to really, again, try and do some really clunky stuff to make it mutable. That's for a reason, but in Rust, it 
in my opinion, much more lax, but still safe. Um, okay, this seems like a thing that I haven't <laughs> updated when I was preparing my slides, but that's fine. Um, well, it's good that it really catches all this weird um, memory bugs with uh, releasing resources and stuff. You all know if you program in Rust already, it's kind of obvious and it's absolutely not obvious to why do you care if you come from JavaScript where everything is garbage collected, it's all fine, no stack based stuff and then no performance benefits. This is the bit that I find that's kind of like, I don't think it's worth mentioning when people compare Rust to JavaScript. It's completely apples and carburetors comparison. Uh, if you write something in JavaScript, you shouldn't, no one should point a finger at you saying, but you didn't low level optimize that thing. <laughs> so, yeah, don't care about performance. Well, you can choose any other modern language, uh, which is mainstream and has all this syntactic niceties of Rust, but doesn't have this problem with uh, this low level stack based thingy. Ha ha, there are none. Well, uh, no mainstream ones. Uh, something good like, I don't know, Swift, maybe. I haven't coded in Swift, just looked, uh, looked at it. Uh, ReasonML is fine or Camelish like, but it's kind of absolutely not popular. And I think it's just every month they think like, is it going to die today? Is it going to die today completely? So yeah, it has a surprise that uh, ReasonML has also an okay support in VS Code as well as Rust, but mm, yeah. Now, I don't think it's gonna ever gonna happen to ReasonML, unfortunately, though I really liked its simplicity and the easy transition from JavaScript, but yeah, not really. And something like F sharp, functional, cool, also based on OCaml, but again, it didn't happen 10 years ago. I don't think it's gonna <laughs> happen tomorrow. And okay, next. Um, thing that I really, really, uh, first I was like, Hmm, so how do I uh, do this, all these tiny little interfaces, like say a uh, human with normally type will have all this kind of overlaying interfaces saying uh, like health. And it will have an interface having a couple of these properties or say uh, location and uh, size, which will be a rectangle basically, the, the boundary interface. And um, how do I translate it to Rust? And there are no simple way to do small interfaces and I'll overlay them on top of a structure. You have to define all this nested uh, um, nested thing is like very small nested uh, structures. It's just kind of good. But yeah, I just wanted to put a picture of a bird's nest here, but it was uh, too late. So sorry, no bird's nest. Uh, <laughs> And also really good thing is this uh, new type. Well, it's not exactly a good thing. It's also a kind of, I feel, attributes to this granularity of your structures, but it has this uh, hideous uh, way of calling the value like dot zero, meaning like just get the first part of the tuple. It's horrible. It looks like, uh, I don't know, unless you're really, really into this, it looks weird. But after you're completely into this, it finds like, oh, it's fine. Yeah. Um, I moved mostly to type aliases from interfaces because they are much more um, clearly, cleanly, uh, cleaner sy syntax to combine those aliases. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it, it, it's uh, type alias is just an alias, and it kind of like. Uh, that's it's unfortunately even in TypeScript type aliases are really kind of like a really uh, bastard child rather than the full blown uh, thing. So interfaces are well better have better support for something like uh, like I don't know Swagger generation if you're familiar with the HTTP REST points and some libraries don't support types and it's really annoying. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. I like the ground nesting, so I want to ad, um, improve my TypeScript version of the simulation using all these smaller uh, structures instead of like just one big blob of an object. Mm, just quickly, okay. Um, semicolons. Um, I don't know if it's uh, some kind of um, thing that as soon as I started writing stuff in Rust, 
I started putting semicolons everywhere in JavaScript. Uh, because I before that I read there was some guy that advocating for don't put a semicolon if you don't really don't really really have to, and I started removing semicolons from everywhere in TypeScript definitions as well, and now I'm coming back full circle to putting semicolons everywhere because it feels Rust-like and it feels very clear, evident. Um, but um, yeah, I really like the OCaml like thing where you just uh, whatever. I'm not sure if it's strictly OCaml-like, but I'm just familiar with OCaml a little bit, so I know that the last thing returned is implicitly the, the return value of the, uh, last thing, the last expression is the return value of the function. So it's, um, it's very conscious. It's very like, I have no problem with writing the uh, code like that anymore. And even JavaScript now, I struggle not to do that. Mm. Okay. Long statements, unfortunately, this is a thing that is still, it's, I'm not sure if it's exactly a problem or it will have it was the way the inference, type in inference works with Rust. But to me, as soon as you go to about unwrap, it kind of like in VS Code, it loses the, the uh, IntelliSense, this uh, autocomplete support. So it's annoying i don't know why it's happening but maybe it's just to have the whoever uh, writes the language service haven't fixed it yet or maybe it's the compiler thing i don't know but i i, I remember it didn't work for me okay that's cool but very long ones but I just imagined that they would source the uh, thing from Rust compiler and it should be reasonably uniform everywhere, but I don't know, but. Uh, oh. So it's, it's, they're moving to a strange place in the uh, Okay, but uh, half a year ago, I think it was much, much worse in terms of VS Code support. So I think now it's a, it's a good time uh, to, to, to do this bit. I find it's a pretty good comparing to some other experimental languages. Uh, closures. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, this was the most puzzling bit that I spent several days just uh, scratching my head um, to figure out like, how do you do this bit? Because this is JavaScript and I, used world activities and then I iterate over them, but I mean, and try to remove one of the keys or every key that was filtered. And in Rust, it's not directly translatable and it's really, really puzzling because of the uh, borrowing and lifetime and not mutating. And it's like, it keep hitting every single bump when you try to convert this code blindly to Rust. And, uh, uh, but I guess the primary issue is that it's not, doesn't use an iterator is uh, this uh, dinosaur of JavaScript where this just does immediate creation of a new array every time you run a, a new operation instead of using iterators like every normal language like C Sharp would do. But I mean, I don't know. The committee in JavaScript is like, yeah, turtle steps, I don't know. Uh, and then I find it's very useful in Rust that uh, hash maps. Um, I think this, if you want to copy this kind of style, yeah, hash maps produce IDs which are copyable because they are just normal ints or something if you use ints. And then you completely detach yourself from this uh, uh, in this variable of like say activity. So you don't have any borrowing problems. It just goes away and you use IDs uh, on top of new instance and in doing this mutation that you like and can again querying something using IDs reasonably safely. Um, enums, this is probably the main reason why I was looking at Rust and thinking like, yeah, that must be the, the it must be the language that I'll eventually like migrate most of my side projects to. Um, and um, kind of like, yeah, they are bulky in a sense that I feel like there could have been something sometimes cutting corners better than the way it's done in Rust. 
um, I'll just explain one by one. So, um, sorry, not not that, not it. Mm, well, let's describe bulky using three other points. So, bin binding generator. So, because I'm obviously writing this uh, kind of like a a thing inside of JavaScript environment in the browser, so I need a way to interact with the rest of JavaScript and just having to translate this into JavaScript friendly stuff, it's uh, boring. And if you have a large surface that you need to migrate, uh, move back and forth between environments, it's really, really, I don't know how it's going to be, but I love enums and that's why everything is so painful for with migrating stuff because this is the JS version of this and I just map it and it's, um, yeah, not pretty. Um, then this is the mapping code that I haven't found a good solution for. So if you look bef just before that, I'm sorry, uh, there's plenty of options because I expect them to be nullable. I haven't, I hope this is how you do it, how you map possibly nullable fields, uh, possibly undefined fields to Rust option. Um, VASM binding generator attribute and the because it requires copy and clone I think maybe clone maybe but um, anyways it's something just I have been forced by Rust to do uh, by Rust. so uh, and to map this thing Rust version Rust friendly version and like this other JavaScript friendly version together it's yeah it's getting this letter and if there are more enums it's uh, enum values it's harder though I think it shouldn't have too many enum values it's actually I think it's close now but still doesn't look pretty but okay I prefer having this clean uh, model in Rust and then doing some mapping instead of just reusing whatever Java friendly structures and passing them along the whole architecture is really really Bad. It looks bad to me. So, um, and but I found this nicety that I didn't see in ReasonML is that option is iterable. I actually by accident started iterating over a variable that's an option. I thought it's an array. I was like, oh, it works, it's good. And then after a couple of hours, I was like, hmm, but why? And uh, then I started reading, and that's a really nice quality of it that you can just collapse all of this uh, option stuff to just the ones that have the sums that have values. So it was really convenient. You can use flat map here, of course, or just for really for obviousness, I put this into two lines, so, but where it, it's a way to map and filter, I guess. But it's, it's really good. I don't think it's the feature that was really, it deserves more attention, I think. Um, so this thing that I haven't solved in any other pre way is filtering. In Rust world, it looks like all the blogs say that you have to do this Boolean for every uh, value of enum that you want to uh, check against. It's like, is this this enum value or is this that? And there's copy paste and copy paste, boilerplate, ah, boring. In uh, JavaScript, uh, well, in TypeScript world, it's called tagged uh, enums, uh, tagged unions, sorry. Um, pretty simple. You just they have the name for the tag for the enum and you just filter it out. So, I don't know. It doesn't look like there's any way unless someone will tell me like, no, nah, you're doing it wrong. Hmm. Oh, macros. Interesting. Okay, I just need to look at, I'm not yet well with macros, but. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that'll be really nice, especially considering I'll have probably more code like that. Ooh. Um, well, the overall perception is the RLS is slow. First, I set up uh, 
to save files on auto out with a delay of three seconds. So I thought, ah, oh, that must be it, just three seconds delay. That started saving it immediately, and still it was just uh, about a couple of seconds slow. And for someone who is not familiar with Rust, it introduces more pain. But I understand because it's open source. No one's uh, paying big buck, and for some reason, no one like Microsoft is interested in investing in more into this kind of language. Yay, let's have more of C++ code. Yeah. We have, don't have enough time. Yeah, just, well, it feels like Rust syntax, but it's, I think it's obvious because Rust is so fresh, it's so purposely built. So every single feature feels like, oh, that's the feature that I should use for that thing. But JavaScript is more like, you have this uh, mutant robot that you just been com com combined of spare parts and it just contains like, a, I, if anyone remembers this uh, old movie called uh, Virus in 1990 something, and it was just this virus that started assembling, uh, merging people with uh, pieces of uh, some, some lamps and some, some just random <laughs> stuff from office works, I don't know. So, <laughs> well, this is how JavaScript feels to me. Um, <laughs> and there's really, really good momentum to be um, invested in Rust now. I feel like, because uh, judging by amount of uh, GitHub stars, it's, um, but I think it's a good indicator, really, if you compare with other stuff. Though I recently, um, there was this uh, language called Bosk or something from Microsoft, and they, um, made several, published several different articles in different uh, online magazines or something about that. And it started gaining uh, like a thousand of stars every day for like a week or something. And it was insane. And I think like, okay, get the stars are like kind of like a thing that you can trust maybe, unless Microsoft's behind it again, Microsoft. Come on, Microsoft. Um, uh, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm originally like spent nine years in C Sharp ecosystem .net, so yeah, TypeScript guy. So, but I know it's like non invented, not invented here syndrome for every big company, and every small company, for every person, every developer. I don't know, but I guess that's it. But yeah, sure, rush towards Rust, learn it, uh, like chip off from chip piece by piece from it every day, you know, every 20 minutes in the morning, uh, especially when you're starting very early in Rust and then it's easier to think over some concepts and Google something during the day instead of just binge coding for a whole weekend. You'll, you'll, not, you'll get, get nowhere because you'll, after four hours of just drilling, borrow, or just really, this uh, <laughs> is just <laughs> trying to, uh, this, uh, using this, uh, whatever it's called, uh, <laughs> doing armor or just doing this uh, with a borrower, fighting. A normal thing, I think fighting with borrower is a normal uh, phase after which you just accept it and then you make peace with it and that's fine. Um, it's the boss and then you're like, yeah, that's fine. You, you, that's, that's really easy to understand. So yeah, go try that. Uh, do it like me. I tried it three times. You can try it three times. Just try small bits. Don't kind of binge uh, and then burn out and then it's really, yeah, yeah, you can burn out from just trying stuff for really intensely and then, so please don't. Okay, cool. And we'll have more speakers than if you do this way, not the burnout way. Thank you. <laughs> yep, it's all fine. Everyone knows Rust. They just, they, this is my experience of slight pain and. Uh... Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>